Welcome in, boils and ghouls. It's me, Tommy, your harrowing ghost host with a brand new Frighter that will have you kitties brimming with anticipation. Yes, this is the first episode of Tommy's Terror Troop Tutorial, a spooky segment about the tantalizing tricks that horror movies use to keep you simply dying for more. It's exhausting talking like this. So I'm going to stop. Alongside me is the classic horror classicist, the bearded bard himself, Ray Delancey. Hi ho, neighbors. And quivering next to him is the relative newcomer to the horror game, the notorious nipple fiddler neophyte, <laughs> and our podcast daddy, Pete Wright. You are a man out of time. <laughs> you I told are you I'd fit, I'd fit amazing. <laughs> amazing. Before we get started, I wanted to address an anxiety I've had about hosting this ever since I pitched the show to my fellow dark sitters. It's called a Tommy's Tutorial, which implies that I am playing the part of an instructor, i.e. one who knows things. Alas, watching a lot of horror movies does not automatically make one a horror mastermind. As such, I have prepared the following disclaimer for Ray to read to the listening audience on my behalf. Ray? Disclaimer. While the host of this podcast, Tommy Metz III, a.k.a. Tommy Handsome, is an avid fan of the horror genre and associated subgenres, he does not purport to be an expert in said field. In no way is he to be thought of as either an authority or a, quote, smarty pants, end quote. In fact, his pants are often known for being quite stupid. As a result, please take any and all knowledge gleaned from the following podcast with a grain of salt the size of a really large grain of salt. Thank you very much, Ray. And I appreciate you really leaning into in no way. <laughs> I, you yeah. put italics there that were not there, but it was appreciated. <laughs> I'm actually pretty sure you cribbed that from Tucker Carlson's disclaimer on his show, right? It was the same, right? Well, Too soon. I like, his Too soon. Last, I like his last words, which were, see you on see you Monday. Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's five by five. See you on Monday. And then they ejected him out of the airlock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that we have set the table, hi guys! Hi, Welcome to Tom. Ter Tommy's Terror Tutorial. It's hard to say. This is my first attempt at briefly examining some of the common or even overused devices in horror films, where they might come from, and what they might mean. First up, Ray, you, before we started recording, said that one of your favorite movies ever is Nosferatu. Nosferatu, and we are going to talk about something that's in Nosferatu. This is a device or a trope called the Book of the Vampire. I am not a vampire guy, but the Book of the Vampire, for lack of a better term, is a trope found in tons and tons of horror movies. And this is one of the first explicit examples of it that I've come across. Uh, for those in the cheap seats, it is found in the 1922 silent film Nosferatu, colon, A Symphony of Horror, directed by F.W. Murnau. It was an unauthorized adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, and so a lot of characters' names are changed and the like. Uh, anyway, a solicitor named Thomas Hutter, instead of the original book, was Jonathan Harker, is sent to Transylvania to work on a real estate deal, spooky, <laughs> with Count Orlock, uh, a creepy castle-dwelling guy who was named Dracula in the book. On the way to the castle, he stops at an inn and finds a book. Now, here's a clip. Uh, it is a silent film, so Pete is going to explain what we are seeing and read the subtitles and stuff like that. And, of course, we will have a link to the clip in the show notes. Pete, when you're ready. A, uh, a man in a striped uh, jacket, waistcoat, yep. looking out a window. He's walking across a room to a candle. The candle is lit. Now he's crossing to the bed. He's sitting upon the bed. This is so far not very scary. No. Yeah, it looks like he's preparing his uh, bedtime rituals. Oh, look at this. A book. I shall read it, he says. No, but toss it back to the bedside table. Oh, another book. I shall read this as well. Provoked. Curious. Screenshot. This is a vampire's ghastly spirits, and I missed it. Seven deadly <laughs> sins because it's spelled wrong. Uh, and that's the book he's reading. From Belial's Seed Spring, Vampire Nosferatu. This is a book, a page from a book, uh, who doth live and feed on the blood of humankind. And it's all in, in uh, well, beyond deliverance, he doth dwell in ghastly caves. Uh, <laughs> sepulchers, I don't know, and coffins filled with God-cursed earth from the fields of the Black Death. I think that should be about it. 
Because I think I'm doing great. Oh, he just yawned. He threw the book, and yep. now he's kicking off his shoes and getting ready for bed. Perfect. We can go ahead We've and done, stop. That's We've it. done great work here today. We've done great the work. The Lord's work. Um, I'm impressed. Written by <laughs> King James. <laughs> there was a lot of, of like, uh, calligraphy. That's the word I was looking for. And how do you pronounce sepulchers? Sep- Sepulcher? Sepulcher? Sepulcher. 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 You yeah. guys Correct. are great. So that smart. was <laughs> back in the days when we had too much ink. Mm-hmm. And so we so had to much. draw everything really big and dumb <laughs> and spell it yeah. wrong. Now, right. how seriously does young Mr. Hutter, who we just saw or heard, take the warnings in the book? Let's see together. When he wakes up the next morning, refreshed in his adorable sleep smock. I'll go ahead and describe it if we can play clip number two. Here we go. Oh, Look at him. Oh, so refreshed. Looking very handsome in his bizarrely huge sleep shirt. He... <laughs> yawns he stretches and wait what's this he finds the book again he opens it and reads the entire first page again start to finish about the seven deadly sins laughs like it's a great joke then yeets the book across the room (laughs) and proceeds to get in a huge fight with his own shirt okay good (laughs) it was not important to play that second clip i just it's so funny but he looks at it he's like (laughs) <laughs> and then, <laughs> then rolls around on the floor. <laughs> so this is this was the ta- the Harker character, right? This, this was that's uh, who we're talking yeah. about. Hutter, 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 yeah, Hutter Harker right. in the book. Harker Hutter in the book. Movie, yes. Hutter in the movie. Now, of course, later when the count moves in across the street from the Hutters, they consult this book, which becomes extremely important to learn more about vampires and how to stop them and how they work. And thus, we have the trope of the book of the vampire. It is a text that explains to the heroes, in essence, the rules of the game, uh, what their enemy is, what to look out for, what to avoid, and how to try and defeat them. And Nosferatu is one of the first times it was laid out so explicitly, in my opinion. And it is shown up over and over and over again. Can I give you way too many examples really quickly? I am so curious about this because what we're saying, like you, you, you say this is one of the first examples that you can find, but one of the first, like, is this considered canonically the the first? Like, is this this is the origin story? I did not come up with the term Book of the Vampire, and you saw that Book of the Vampire was not actually the name of that in the right. clip. That actually comes from uh, a movie a little bit later, another silent film called Vampire, V A M P Y R, where mm. that book translated from German is much more closely the book of the vampire. Okay. I just chose Nosferatu because it's earlier and I mm-hmm. was having trouble finding a clip when, of the other one. When, when was Nosferatu released? 1922. Uh, 1922. 1922, correct. So what I'm seeing is the vampire, the short work of prose fiction that you mentioned as I'm mm-hmm. Googling frantically was 1819. That's the movie? No, the book, the short correct. work of prose fiction by John William Polidori, taken from the story Lord Byron told as part of that writing contest. The Mary Shelley? The Mary Shelley writing contest, the overnight thing where Frankenstein was also originated. So I'm strictly going with movies. Yes, I want you to. I just need books, to, yeah. to set my to set the, the conceit that that cinematically, this right. was the adaptation that spawned all the rules that, that is what that I we're still positive. living on. Okay. Yes, and Got I it. have. I had a film professor that brought up uh, the book of the vampire. He did not show us any clips uh, because this was back in the when was I in college? The nineteen twenties. <laughs> um, uh, we just had like town criers telling us what happened <laughs> because I'm the, the old tower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, that's what I'm saying. Is that the book of the vampire can be seen and is a crucial part, unlike other genres. I think, and that's what the discussion is going to be. Is okay. what I think is a crucial part of pretty much every horror movie. And if I can here, I didn't want to try to make a full list because that would be impossible. So instead I did what I normally do. I stared for a little while at my (laughs) DVD collection and just looking from my DVD collection. Here's what I found. Are you ready? Sure. Mm. All right. In it, Ben goes through the town history of Derry at the library, uncovering all the terrible things that Pennywise made happen and when. Book the Vampire. In The Changeling, George C. Scott gets information about who used to live in his haunted house by looking at microfish. Book of the Vampire. In The Babadook, there's literally a book called Mr. Babadook that Amelia <laughs> finds in her son Sam's room, describing the monster and later explaining it will get stronger the more she ignores it. 
in House on Haunted Hill. I own that. Yep. Two characters find the admin office in the asylum that shows them the connections between them and the past murderous staff that used to work there. In Mike Flanagan's Oculus, it's the compendium of photos and newspaper articles Kaylee presents to her younger brother, Tim, documenting the history of the antique mis- mirror. The same type of collection of articles and files is given to skeptical writer, skeptical writer Mike Enslin by spooky hotel manager Jared Olin in the film 1408, based on Stephen King's short story. In an interesting twist, in Cabin in the Woods, our protagonists are presented with dozens of potential books of the vampire as they sift through the found objects in the cabin's basement before finally settling on the diary of Patience Buckner and her gross family of weirdos. In another interesting twist... And this is the last one. In Steve Sarmento's favorite film, Midsommar, the audience, not the protagonists, are given the Book of the Vampire as an opening graphic shows the entire plot of the movie in a highly stylized, granted somewhat hard to comprehend at first, painting. And then later shows other future plot points, including bears, on a banner that we see, but the characters seemingly don't. Good examples? Yeah, great examples. Yeah. And don't forget Apollo 13, Book of the Vampire, NASA Notebooks. NASA Notebooks. That's a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> that it doesn't in- necessarily fly. <laughs> that- but, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another example, the Bible. It's all there. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I, I mean, I get what you're saying now, and I'm curious from your perspective, when you are referring to these, the, the trope, like, is it fair to say, oh, that's a book of the vampire as shorthand for, like, when you're writing a script, right? Like, Correct. as a, like, you, you would say something like, hey, we need to create a book of the vampire here, something to, to illustrate the concept. I have said it, and mostly people look at me like I just showed a dog a card trick. That's because why we're doing this terribly, podcast, so we yeah, can it's not a terribly well-known <laughs> phrase. And it's also, again, this is a discussion, not a lecture, so you yeah. could also be like, wait, this is the same thing as in every romantic comedy. I don't know. <laughs> I would just like to put it out there. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I like the idea of it. Like, I like the whole conceit of it, especially because I did not expect you to give us a list of examples that did not include vampire movies. Right. right? Like, that was the whole point. Yeah. yeah. No, I that is a surprise to me. But I'm not well, the I'm not the one who is experienced and a, a, as broadly experienced in the oeuvre as as you guys are. So I'm just sort of throwing stuff at, at you. I appreciate it. And you said you like lists. You want another? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's a quick one. It should be noted, and this has happened much more um, in recent times. Uh, more recent films and also especially I think with um, maybe with slasher films Mm -hmm. that the book of the vampire can also just be a person or a character that shows up and explains what's going on and why may I give you some examples from my DVD collection uh, okay let me just before you give us an example in the vampire oeuvre would that be like the Van Helsing character yes would that be like Herman Munster in Pet Cemetery? Yes, about uh, sometimes dead is better. Yes, correct. Okay. That okay. someone that knows what's going on comes and sort of monologues. And it's yeah. almost always in the same part in the movie. You have a whole bunch of confusing, 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 and then they go see a specialist or someone yeah. shows up. For instance, in the original Hellraiser, Pinhead shows up to explain to Christy that the Cenobites are not angels nor demons, but instead are explorers, to use his word, whose extreme experiences have left them unable to tell the difference between pleasure and pain. Oh, and how the box works. In It Follows, after they have sex near an old Anamaru factory, sexy. Hugh explains to Jay that she's going to be followed by a something now, and then he bounces like a real dick. In Dark Skies, <laughs> the alien-plagued Barrett family consult the Grays expert, Edwin Pollard, played by J.K. Simmons, whose walls are covered in newspaper articles and maps and yarn. I bring that one up. Dark Skies isn't a terribly well-known movie. I'm a really big fan of it. But that is such an archetype of finally finding someone on the internet now and mm-hmm. going to them. They're usually a very discredited person. Who's like, who always says, no, 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 I won't talk to you. I won't talk to the press. I'm tired of being made fun of. Wait, what? And -hmm. then it turns out that he's real. Um, Just a couple other ones. In the mist, soldier Jessup reveals that the military at the nearby Arrowhead Project accidentally ripped a hole between dimensions, allowing a bunch of monsters to come in and terrorize the town's Kroger. Back to Cabin in the Woods, Sigourney Weaver, playing the director of the underground facility, gives the real 
B of the V, Book of the Vampire, as she explains the rituals behind what is going on and what who they are meant to appease. And oh, this is it. Oh, oh no. Well, no, I'll just do this one because it's my favorite, Jacob's Ladder. Do I was, you remember the I, book? I was going to ask you who you're uh, about uh, Jacob's Ladder. How do you, you know who, who I would consider the Book of the Vampire I, in Jacob's I'm Ladder? On tenterhooks. I don't know, Ray, do you have a guess? It's been forever since I've watched Jacob's Ladder, so I wouldn't have a good guess. That's right. I should have maybe made this more of a game <laughs> instead of just screaming <laughs> at you. My apologies. I'll think about that <laughs> for the future. Do you remember he's like followed around by this guy, this sort of bushy haired guy played by Matt Craven. His name is Michael. He turns out to be a drug dealer who was caught and turned into a scientist that was involved with the experimentations on the military leading to, at least as far as we know, spoiler alert, the horrific visions that all the veterans are explaining. Mm -hmm. That's where we actually get the term Jacob's Ladder. They called the drug the ladder and it goes mm -hmm. all the way up right into your subconscious. Down into okay. your subconscious. Well, I don't know how ladders work. So what do you guys think? Is it interesting that horror movies are one of the only types of movies to use this pretty blatant device? Like, are there, am I missing something? Are there other genres where someone or something just shows up and is purely exposition? Well, I, I think um, uh, like spy movies, right? Okay. okay like uh, we don't know what Treadstone is until we get a uh, cranky, face spy head in the picture to come and and talk about what's going on in that right do you see what i mean like that jason Bourne, there is like there is a, a whole lot of mystery similar to this to the horror vibe and then someone has to come in and tell us the audience what's going on usually in some sort of a conference room where our protagonist is out <laughs> doing another thing but we have a conference room meeting and the same thing holds true for jack ryan some sort of political uh, operative comes in and explains here's what's going on you know what him our protagonist is out there trying to do right and will explain sort of the rules of the game so i don't know does that fit the model it doesn't not except it seems like unless i misheard you it was explained to the audience not the protagonist well i was kind of going off of your midsummer example too right oh like, sure but that that was a very weird that was just yeah. something that i wanted to throw in there that's very yeah. unconventional um right. what about uh, related to what pete said uh i thought of in raiders of the lost ark whenever uh harrison ford and denim elliott are being briefed by the two government agents about what belloc is doing in the desert they literally opened the giant book of the lore oh. right <laughs> shoot what that's really think? is just a book huh <laughs> what do you think of it <laughs> That is very true, <laughs> but there's no vampires involved. Well, this has been Tommy's trope. But it's no, 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 no. But it's also it's also like leads to horrific discoveries, right? right. Like I, I don't think that it discounts the value of the book of the vampire as a trope in horror. Um, but I do think action, like action movies, also sort of play in that in that same game. It's not quite as explicit, but it does lead to opportunities for ex uh, 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 exposition dump. Right? Yeah. Let's just let's just tell you what's going on, so you don't have to to track. So I'm I'm I, I, I think I'm that's maybe ahead. where I'm leaning is just how explicit it is. Yes, and why it's called the book of. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just finds a book, and it's like, hey, right. idiot. Here's just everything about this. And, he, <laughs> and he's already scared because he goes into the inn and everyone in the inn, he mentions Count Orlock and everyone's like, yeah. G -g 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 -g. and so he's already like <laughs> kind of scared. He turns into Popeye. He goes, -g 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 -g. <laughs> um. <laughs> but this is what's so interesting about that, Tom, is that like, I, I, so you already mentioned Cabin in the Woods and I, I can't let that go by without sure. mentioning Buffy the Vampire Slayer, particularly the series, which is just an episode by episode book of the vampire by week. Right, Tell there's me, always another I, monster and I've Giles. I've seen one episode of oh. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and of course, it's once more with feeling the musical which is episode. Outs, which is outstanding, and, and the creator has no problems. Okay, go ahead. Right. What um, what do you know about this the show? The entire thing is written from the perspective of this hero character who is fighting evil and doing good against the dark, and the book of the vampire is both in the form of her mentor and and teacher the librarian giles uh oh, and yeah. rupert giles but he is a librarian and right. every week he brings out another book 
that is, that demonstrates this ghoul or ghast or monster that they're going to have to fight and educates us, the audience, what they have to do. And the model so perfectly huh. lines up with what you're talking about. They fight a whole bunch at, for, you know, 22 minutes, right? Then we break into the second half of the episode and it's like, oh my God, we've all done research at the library and now we found a resource that's going to tell us all exactly what happens at the perfect moment to give our heroine the uh, tools that she needs and the rest of the Scooby gang need to actually yeah. solve the mystery and beat the evil and 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 do good. So like it, you take the sort of book of the vampire concept and apply it to a serial. Um, didn't they do the same thing with uh, what was it? The, the nightmare on Elm street TV show it was the same thing. It was like book of the vampire a week to give us, here's an artifact. We have to learn about it. And there are horrific things that it allows us to do, right. but we're going to teach the audience and our heroes about it in order to, to solve it. That's an that sounds... outstanding comparison. There was a nightmare on Elm street TV show. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Freddy's nightmares. Freddy's nightmares. Oh, was, there was also was it just like a series. Like he wasn't in it, or he was in it. Was he the crypt keeper? Y yeah. Here's another episode, bitch. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cut. Uh, I, uh, Ray, I, and I'm I'm I. There was uh, I I actually can't remember uh, if I'm if I'm referring to the right thing. Was it Night Nightmare on Elm Street? The series, but it was it was it was Ray actually Freddy's nightmares. It, that was, was definitely a show. Series Friday the 13th, that was, that was the artifact by artifact one, right? Where there were these haunted artifacts that they had I, to track down. That Ooh. sounds right. I, I'm not, I've never actually watched it, but I've seen like uh, all of these documentaries shows. that talk about it and the stuff. Yeah. Friday the 13th, the series. This is, <laughs> I watched this and I, I'll tell you, I loved it so much when, um, um, but uh, let's see. Fantasy horror television series ran for three seasons in, uh, from 87 to 90. And wow, the right whole my... conceit, it was originally titled, yes, The 13th Hour, but producer Frank Bancuso thought it would turn any viewers away and instead took the name thir Friday the 13th to draw in audiences. It has no connection to the series. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, Jason Voorhees does not make an appearance, oh, nor yeah. does any character connected to the film because it's uh so it the whole thing is that this this antiques dealer made a deal with the devil to sell cursed antiques and he broke the pact and it cost him his soul and now um his like offspring inherited the store full of cursed antiques and they have to go get everything back so every week is a journey through like the book of the vampire for that cursed antique as they try to resolve its it's um I uh, love provenance. that kind of show because it yeah. just becomes such a playground. Yes. You can yes. just do whatever you want. That's absolutely so cool. did the same thing. Like I think the uh Warehouse 13 on Sci-Fi Channel inherited yes. that pedigree too, right? Ask me who tried to get his company to buy Warehouse 13. <laughs> I'll bet you did. Did you do me? that? I, when that I was, was working at John Wu's company, show. that it came across not as a TV show, but as a full feature film. Oh. And I was like, this is the one. This is the one. And they said, be quiet. <laughs> Which is fine. <laughs> they did that a lot. <laughs> and it wasn't bought until way later and then became yeah. something totally different. But I was so turned on because that was around like when it doesn't matter. There's too many uh, digressions going on. But, but yeah, but that's exactly that's the, whole, the same thing. That's the whole conceit. So I wonder, like, I, I, as I'm thinking about this, like, it's, it, it's, it's, I feel like I'm sort of seeing through the matrix, right? That, that right. this is, when you call it a, a trope, to me, this you can decode so many properties once you figure out what the book of the vampire is and where you are in the narrative. Yeah, and introduced. and I love the idea of what you said, Ray, about um, <laughs> what's called Raiders of the Lost Ark, and what you said about TV and stuff like that. I mean, it could spy things. Definitely, probably could be if there's a big mystery box, mm -hmm. then there'll be a book of the vampire. Lost did it for eight seasons. <laughs> it still yeah. never really. <laughs> opened it to put this one to bed. So now when you see your hero open a drawer and find the file they were looking for or blow dust off an old book found in a basement or talk to a person in a dark room that seems to know a lot about one thing that sets off red flags, you can now scream book of the vampire at the top of your lungs as you are quickly <laughs> escorted out of the theater. <laughs> Topic number two for Tommy's tutorial trope terror. Here we go. It starts with a quiz. I'm making things into a quiz now. You ready? Outstanding. All right. Who? And you can buzz in with your name. Who is Sally Hardesty? Ray. Oh, I know. 
Uh, Ray, go. She, she's the protagonist in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Exactly 74. right. Toby Hooper's 1974, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and one of the first official final girls found in Ooh. horror film tradition. Would either of you like to tell the audience, because I know at least one of you will know a lot of it, uh, what the idea of a final girl is, and maybe if you, for extra points, where the term came from. Okay, well, uh, you know, the final girl comes from uh, the uh, the girl that makes it through the whole movie without getting killed to death. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, a lot of the time she's uh, a virgin or uh, a pure character, an innocent, whereas the other characters are portrayed as, you know, party goers, drug doers, fornicators, etc. And uh, I, I don't know where the term first came from, to be honest. I'll tell you, it's not I that gotta, much I gotta, of a thing, but I gotta, you're exactly I gotta right. Guess. I gotta oh, guess. Oh, go for it. Uh, it. It was either Black Christmas or Psycho. What, the term Final Girl came from? Yeah. Yeah, because there was a there was the book. Uh, it was Men, Women, and Chainsaws: Gender and Modern Horror Film, right? And I think <laughs> yes, you're exactly right. I by, think the author by Carol Clover, Carol in Clover, yep, correct. yep. And I think didn't she posit that the first one was either of those two movies? I can't remember which because we just did Black Christmas not too long ago on the show, and I think we talked about this. She puts um, Sally Hardesty from Chainsaw Massacre and what's her name from Black Christmas. Uh, Jesse Jess Bradford mm -hmm. equal okay. as both final girls. Correct. She actually says that what's her name in um, Psycho is not a oh, final okay. girl. That All she right. is a female survivor because she has like a cohort. She has a guy with her. Yeah, for a yeah. Ton of the yeah, time that's right. Who that's ends right. up like saving things? Whereas final girls can be aided by like police showing up and shooting someone yeah. or something. But it's at the very end. Yep. Um, to quote, if I can quote to you from Carol Clover's book, the final girl is the one who encounters. Oh, and Ray, you were 100 percent right across the board. And you even got into the morals, which was great. The final girl is the one who encounters the mutilated bodies of her friends and perceives the full extent of the preceding horror and her own peril. Hmm. Who is cornered, wounded, whom we see scream, stagger, fall, rise and scream again. She is abject terror personified. And yes. She is usually, not always, and we'll get into that at the end, she is usually an innocent compared to her cohorts mm -hmm. uh, when we get into, like, sex equals death stuff. Would you guys like to try to list some final girls? Again, I'm learning as we go, and I'm going to <laughs> a heavy list. But instead, if you want to guess some, we can see. How about we go back and forth? Yeah, I like it. All right, Pete, Ray, Pete, Ray. Pete, why don't you start? Oh, and we're taking Jess Bradford and uh, Sally off of the list. Okay, go. Yes, yeah, I would go. I would certainly go for one of those. But I want to. I want to. I'm playing a little bit dirty because this is the first one that comes off my uh, list, and I know it was going to be Ray's first pick. So since you've given me the choice, I will say yep. uh, Halloween. Right? L uh, what's her name? Strode. L Lori Strode. Good. Yeah. What's her name? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and no. I do it with disrespect too. Oh, <laughs> Ray appears in your square and just nails you to the wall. <laughs> uh, uh, I abstain. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> so, and no looking, only and no I looking things up. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is honor code. Another good one is uh, Nancy Cartwright from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Correct. Okay, so I would have said that. Um, how about what else uh, have we done? Recently? Oh, we will though put a, a little asterisk. Her, uh, she is uh, Nancy is definitely the final girl, but her fate is kind of ambiguous at the end of that movie when her mom is pulled through the door until she shows up in Dream Warriors. But oh, she's yeah. absolutely yeah, the final yeah, girl. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, how about um, uh, Sydney Prescott? Very good. Scream. How about that? Ooh, yeah. Scream. Yes. All right, I will say um, Alice in Friday the 13th. The Alice first Hardy. One. Very good. D I don't know that this counts. I, I think I would I would probably not, like, if I, I'm going to say this, and if I were in your shoes, Tommy, I would not accept it as an answer. But I'm going to say it anyway, because this is, I think, the last thing that I have to offer. Okay. Ellen Ripley. 
I would 100% say that she is really? a final girl. Yes. And I think she actually is listed in like major lists of things. What makes you discount your... Uh, I think because of what Ray said, right? Like it, it that that example of the crew, everybody's fine. Like they're all doing their thing together. Just the fact that she was not killed until the very end doesn't satisfy the sort of moral requirement of everybody else's failing on that crew. They're all just trying to survive. The moral thing is a sometimes, and it has been incredibly subverted as of late. So I would, I understand yeah. your trepidation, but I would definitely put there. I mean, she's in her undies at the end. Yeah. Your you know, final girl great. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Does that change in all? subsequent films? Her. I mean, she keeps surviving until that one time she doesn't. She but then she pulls, does again. She pulls a Sydney Prescott, as we'll get into. She gets stronger and stronger yeah. and stronger. That's okay. something that changes. Okay. Um, did you want to list any more, Ray? Or I can just. We can, I think we're, I'm good. Okay. Oh, can, can I just, I just have one more thing to say. And yeah. it's because it's, I, did you see the movie? It came out some years ago uh, called uh, The Final Girls. No. I oh haven't. yeah. Starring what's that movie name? is so great. It's, it's so, so great. Really awesome. Yeah. It's so great because it like, it pokes at every one of these things for all of the girls in the movie. <laughs> so you never really know what's going on. It's great. Oh, it's great. I have to watch I it. Have to figure that out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Put it up the list. Yeah, worth it. We also have Christy and Hellraiser, Julie James in I Know What You Did Last Summer, and Tree in Happy Death Day. I only oh, I wanted Happy to include Death Happy Day. Death Day because we've talked about it. Oh, um, so good. And Easy yeah, enough. getting into the idea of some fun changes on how we approach the final girl, both Sidney Prescott and Laurie Strode in the Scream and Halloween franchises both start off very meek and very virginal. Uh, Laurie Strode is very... She's not going to the parties with her friends. Uh, what's her name is having a very PG. Sydney Prescott is having, in her words, a very PG thirteen relationship with her boyfriend before he falls off the ladder. All of that, and as things go, they adapt to become absolute badasses. Where Sydney Prescott is just ripping off uh, one liners, like "Now it's your time to scream, a hole" mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I don't exactly remember. Uh, other examples are Max, played by Mia Goth and Ty West's ex is a final girl, but she is no innocent. She's a born star. No. That's yeah. kind of the opposite of an innocent, but she's the only one that makes it out alive. And the character of Jay, I just wanted to bring this up because it's in the aforementioned It Follows, has sex right at the top of the movie. And she lives. Although, again, it's a very ambiguous uh, ending as she and, I'm going to say, Paul are followed by maybe a creep. Um, and then, finally, finally, just because I want to mention it as much as possible, Cabin in the Woods, the director, Sigourney Weaver, tries to classify potential final girl Dana as the virgin of the group. Uh, if you remember, Dana goes, what? Me, a virgin? And Weaver <laughs> says, we work with what we have. <laughs> so what do we think about this final girl trope? This is not something that I'm presenting. This has obviously been in yeah. a book and everything like this. But there is controversy about it. Is it? Do you find the final girl to be empowering or misogynistic or somewhere in between? I would love to know your feelings about it personally i think it's uh based on the film in question i think mm. each director portrays the final girl in uh in their own personal way because you do get those different variations on that trope depending on the film you know you have a movie like was just discussed on the next reel with the slumber party massacre where the mm. i think it's a very female positive uh type of role there whereas in something else uh, you might have more of an exploitation centered theme around that person as opposed to her can you think of an example of the exploitation it's, it's kind of putting you on the spot i apologize no no you're fine i just you know have a terrible brain for remembering things on the sure. spot <laughs> of course. um maybe i spit on your grave have you guys seen i spit on your grave a long haven't. time ago uh, Last House really on the Left say. is interesting. Last House on the Left, there's yeah. not really a final girl, there's final parents, but the woman in it in the first one is very, I think, exploitative. And then the, whatever, however you say that word. And then this, not the sequel, but the remake, right. there's a lot more power and stuff involved. So again, that is a version of evolving. 
Yeah. I mean, you look at Ellen Ripley, too, like you to your point, she's in her underwear at the end of the first movie. In the end of the second movie, she's in the loader like that yeah. is a massive upgrade from underwear. Yeah. And, and uh, so I, I think that's really important. I think there's I, I so I don't I, I think I'm on the side of it's it's. Yes, generally, as it was used in the 70s and 80s, it is exploitative. It's also, though, at the disservice, once it became a trope, it's at the disservice of story. And I'm really curious mm. your take on that, because once you can pick out the final girl, you can solve the movie, right? Like, there, it reduces the surprise, because you know how tropes are supposed to play out, which is why movies like Cabin in the Woods, etc., like, work, because they subvert the expectation. But what happens if you just remove gender expectations from horror films does it make is there opportunity just to make movies better if we never know you know if we remove the trope of final girl it's an interesting point i mean we in our lifetimes we've seen a major example of that other than cabin of the woods which was the original scream 100 percent, drew mm -hmm. barrymore was the final girl she was yes. the only one on the poster Right. Like there was, I mean, and then they set up an entire psycho like twist yeah. where the lead died in the first opening moments. Yeah. Um, and so there are ways to play with it, even following, like breaking the rules that you're supposed to be following. Yes. But you're saying toss all the rules out. Well, and see. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I think Scream is actually a great example because they had rules to break. Right. I, I'm just wondering as a filmmaker, like I'm asking you, like legit as a filmmaker, do, do you think it do you think tropes like this serve filmmaking in this genre? I think people like rules to a certain extent. And one of the w reasons that people go to see horror movies is not to just be scared out of their wits because then we'd be insane. It's to go through something safely. It's mm -hmm. to live through something very, very scary in a way that you know you're going to come out the other end. And so potentially some of these tropes and ones that we'll talk about in future episodes might be important for that relationship. That every if everything is just a David Cronenberg insane fest, or his son, I just saw Infinity Pool, and the amount of things they throw at the screen there that don't follow anything, it's very unsettling. And at times that's great, and at times that's just really rough. It takes away some of the enjoyment, maybe. So I just yeah. wonder if some of the, the rules, for lack of a better word, give you sort of that safe zone in order to live through the experience. So, you know, I love Midsommar. Is Danny yep. the final girl in Midsommar and in the in the flower crowns with a smile on her face. That's a really, I didn't on purpose put her in the list because I can't figure that out because yeah. even the end of the movie deletes itself. She is clearly crying and screaming at the end of the movie. And then there's that weird crossfade to her smiling. Yeah. Which is not, which seems to come from another thing and maybe is just what she thinks. I don't know where we're supposed to be by the end of that movie, so I'm not sure. She does live, but we also don't find out whatever happens to May Queens. All we see of May Queens are a whole bunch of black and white pictures yeah. up on that one wall. I have a feeling that the rituals might not end with just Yeah, let's be clear. Her uh, Ari Aster an, knows what happens to May Queens, yeah. and I'll bet in his lifetime we're going to find out. Yeah, they give her an entire garden outfit, and then yeah. I think that she <laughs> takes a trip off that weird rock. <laughs> oh, the Bastion Rock. Uh, Ray, what do you think as far as what Pete was asking about uh, the tropes and whether they're standing in the way? It would be an interesting experiment to try to discard the usual tropes because they are very plentiful no matter what era we're in. But if you do that, I think you better be damn sure that what you are making is solid because right. not only will you be known as the person that discarded all the tropes because you thought you were going to make something better, but what you wound up with was just crap in the end anyway <laughs> right you broke I, the rules yeah. just to fall over yourself well and i, I think that's <laughs> the biggest question right ray is that you know we are we're complex human organisms when it comes to story and are you know part of the reason tropes become tropes is because we're incapable of breaking all the rules all the time like we're wired to tell stories 
in this sort of functional way. And I wonder, like, w- to your point, like when the rules do get broken, does it just make stupid stories? I will say to what Tommy mentioned before, uh, I think tropes are evolving a bit because you do see different versions of them, you know, whereas the final girl trope may have been exploitative back in the 70s and 80s. I thought of a few more examples. Friday the 13th, part five, you see Trish, I think her name is, just running around in that white top in the rain and (laughs) see through and she's with a little black kid uh, for good measure to make it creepy. And just uh, for like the final half hour of that movie, that's like the whole reason she's on that screen to be the final person out in the rain with this see-through top on. And then even in Friday the 13th part six, there's that part where you're in the car with that girl and Tommy and to hide him from view, she like jams his face in her crotch and you get that camera right in like the breakfast club shot. Oh, the POV. (laughs) Yeah. Because everyone was like, I wonder what that looks like. (laughs) So (laughs) (laughs) amazing and unexpected improvisation. (laughs) But yeah, but I, I say that to say this, uh, Today, whereas you still have the final girl trope, I think you don't see it in that way. Uh, It has evolved into something that is more empowering at best, neutral at worst, I think. I like that. And just for the record, uh, remember Clover, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, the writer, she went on record saying that she did not think that the final girl was feminist. A lot of people did see it as empowering. She said, quote, to applaud the final girl as a feminist development, dot, 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 is in light of her figurative meaning, a particularly grotesque expression of wishful thinking. Uh, yeah. She viewed the character as someone given the privilege of surviving because of what male female male filmmakers liked in their women attractiveness virginity no taboos white tops all of that stuff yeah uh but as the trope evolved some feminists uh noticed that through this device the males in the audience who are making up a ton of the audience for this are forced to identify with the woman in the climax when women won they were able to force men to watch them step into their own power Mm -hmm. so the question Mm -hmm. has not been answered but it has very much gone back and forth i think you can see it but the most important thing is what ray just said is it is obviously uh evolving especially in a heightened horror while it's becoming not as clear what a final girl is if there is a final girl um they are tougher they're smarter they're putting on shoes immediately. <laughs> like all the old <laughs> things that people like forget to do. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I think you see movies like you brought up Happy Death Day and what was the Vince Vaughn body switching horror movie that we freaky. saw that was slash freaky that was which which are addressing so many of those those sort of trope failures of the trope in really interesting and I think yeah. finally empowered ways, right? right? Like that that we can move on from the genderification of horror movies and realize that the story itself is what should make the story interesting and, and titillating and provocative, whatever it is, and not this trope, like model figure of the surviving virginal, like stereotype of, uh, you know, sexuality. And it, it, because we can be done with that. Right. Maybe that's the answer to that great question that you asked is we are subverting it by commenting on it instead Mm -hmm. of just throwing out baby bathwater we are saying this is what it was and this is what it shouldn't be anymore right maybe that is the i don't want to use the word hand holding but that's the guardrail that we need in order to start throwing things out in order to make it acceptable yeah Mm -hmm. So that's it. So when you see a woman running in the forest, you scream, final girl. And they'll be like, how did you get back to the theater? We threw you out after you screamed, book of the vampire. Uh, I am ready to wrap things up unless you guys have final things to say. I'm I'm good. I love this tutorial, Tom. I hope it is the first of many. Oh, I appreciate it. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this harrowing tromp through tropes we see while sitting in the dark. Until next time, we've been the delight Peter Wright. I have been. And the fancy Ray Delancey. Bye. And Tommy Mess the Turd. 
Thank you, boils and ghouls. Until next time, pleasant screams.